To understand Islam, Muslims and Islamic culture, you must understand the life of Muhammad. In Islam, Muhammad is the last messenger from God, the perfect model for all mankind. He is the founder of the Islamic empire. His life is the very context for understanding the Quran. And wherever you see the word Allah, you nearly always see the name Muhammad right next to it. Any definition of Islam that excludes Muhammad is a false definition. So how do we learn the story of Muhammad's life? It may surprise you, but it is not from the Quran. The Quran can certainly tell us much about Muhammad, but it is not a record of what he did. If you want to know what Muhammad did, then you need to consult other Islamic books. These are the biographies of Muhammad's life called the Sirah. Some famous early biographies were written by Ibn Ishaq, Al-Waqidi, and Ibn Sa'd. And there are also books called the Hadith, which tell us about Muhammad. Islamic historians would not automatically accept everything written in these books. They seek to test the reliability of these accounts. And there are modern historians who say that much of this material is not reliable at all. However, the vast majority of Muslims never read these books. Instead, they are told about Muhammad's life from their leaders and later Islamic writers. The presentation that I am giving here is the traditional account of Muhammad's life based on the oldest accounts that have been accepted by later Islamic scholars. Let's first consider the early life of Muhammad. Muhammad was born around 570 AD. He was an Arab and a member of the Quraysh tribe who were located in Mecca. This tribe were the keepers of one of the many holy shrines in Arabia. The two main towns of Muhammad's activity were Mecca and Yathrib, which became known as Medina. His father died before he was born, and he was looked after by various family members, the last being Abu Talib, his uncle. We are told that Abu Talib once took Muhammad on a journey to Syria, where he met a Christian monk called Bahira, who spoke with Muhammad about God. As a young man, he began to work as a trader for a woman called Khadija. She was 15 years older than Muhammad, and when he was 25, they got married. We're also told that he loved the seclusion of caves, where he would seek the spiritual. Now, what was Muhammad's world like? There were two main empires, the Persian Empire to the northeast, officially Zoroastrian, but with many Christians, Jews and others, and the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire to the northwest. This was a Christian empire in which the Byzantine Christians ruled over Syrian, Coptic and Arab Christians and Jewish and other populations. To the west was Abyssinia, an African Christian kingdom. And then there was Arabia itself. Many of the Arabs were traders. We read about traders from Mecca who owned land in Syria, which they used as a base for their trading. Some of them had formed armies which worked for the Byzantines or Persians. Many were raiders, raiding each other and those surrounding Arabia. There were small kingdoms in various places, but no central government. It was a combination of nomads and settled communities based along tribal lines. There were also Christian and Jewish towns in Arabia. The traditional Arab religions tended to be animistic, that is the worship of stones, trees and idols. And there were spirit inspired prophets and fortune tellers. But we are also told that some of the Arabs had rejected these Arab religions and were known as seekers. Interestingly, one of these was an uncle of Muhammad, Waraka, who became a Christian and was a writer of the gospel. In many ways, Arabia was a mission field for Christians and Jews. There was freedom to preach, and we read of Arabian tribes converting to Christianity. Christians and Jews were bringing their holy books to this area and telling their stories. 
They were speaking against idols and seeking conversions and getting some. Some were miracle workers and apostle-like characters. Monotheism was alive and growing on the Arabian Peninsula. Now, we see that Muhammad was aware of and influenced by the Christians and Jews around him. Narrated Ibn Abbas, the prophet used to copy the people of the scriptures, Christians and Jews, in matters in which there was no order from Allah. Narrated Al-Bara, we prayed along with the prophet facing Jerusalem for 16 or 17 months. Then Allah ordered him to turn his face towards the Qibla in Mecca. And so we see that Muhammad took some of his ideas and practices from the Jews and Christians around him. At around the age of 40, in one of his sessions in the cave, Muhammad, like Augustine, heard a voice saying, Read, and this was the beginning of his revelations. Now, Muhammad's life is normally divided into two sections, his time in Mecca and his time in Medina. Let's look at the first of these. In Mecca, he was one of many voices speaking about religion and was initially accepted. We read, when the apostle openly displayed Islam as God ordered him, his people, the Quraysh, did not withdraw or turn against him, so far as I have heard, until he spoke disparagingly of their gods. When he did that, they took great offence and resolved unanimously to treat him as an enemy. But they, the Muslims, were a despised minority. Abu Talib, his uncle, treated the apostle kindly and protected him. The Quraysh said, O Abu Talib, your nephew has cursed our gods, insulted our religion, mocked our way of life, and accused our forefathers of error. Either you must stop him or you must let us get at him. So we see that at first, Muhammad was accepted by his people until he began to speak against their religion and culture. Then they began to oppose him. They persecuted some of his followers, but Muhammad himself was protected by his uncle, Abu Talib, who actually never accepted Muhammad as a prophet. While Muhammad was in Mecca, he did not retaliate with violence. He did make threats, but no more. During this time, he was teaching about God and reciting the revelations that came to him. These revelations were the start of the Quran. Now, what was the character of his preaching and the Quran like at this time? They included the following. That Muhammad was a true prophet, there is only one God, idols are nothing, there is a judgment day and paradise and hell. Muhammad would preach in homes, in market areas, in towns and on the roads where pilgrims would travel. Some people from other towns became Muslims, particularly people from Medina, but generally throughout this period he had few followers. Now much of what I've said so far you would find in a modern Islamic publication on Muhammad's life. But before we move on to consider the second stage of Muhammad's life, that is his time in Medina, we need to realize that there are things Muhammad did that Islamic leaders do not tell us about. When Muslims tell us about Muhammad, they are not simply telling us about him, but are seeking to honor him, and this affects what they say. We see this type of selection by the Islamic scholar Ibn Hisham, who edited an early biography of Muhammad's life. He writes, God willing, I shall begin this book of the Prophet's biography and omitting some of the things which Ibn Ishaq has recorded in his book, things which it is disgraceful to discuss, matters which would distress certain people. What is Ibn Hisham saying? If an event is disgraceful or distressing, he will not include it in his account of Muhammad's life. Modern Muslim writers do the same thing. Traditions containing such remarks of the prophet as may not be part of his prophetic vocation or such expressions as are clearly unsuitable for him should be rejected. That is, if a recorded event in Muhammad's life is distressing or disgraceful or does not honor him, then it must not be accepted as true. This is one of the criteria that Muslim scholars use to determine their history. But this is not how you do history. You cannot reject a well-documented historical account simply because you find it uncomfortable. The result is that we are not told many well-attested and significant events in Muhammad's life. For instance, there was a time Muhammad compromised his monotheism 
and accepted the gods of Mecca. He had an old man and a woman assassinated because they spoke out against him and at least one man tortured for money. There was another time when he said God had given him permission to marry his attractive daughter-in-law. He beat one of his wives and he married a girl when she was six and consummated the marriage when she was nine. He also had a mosque burnt down. Now remember, he is meant to be the perfect example for all humanity. All of these events are well attested to in the Islamic sources and are significant. When Muslims are handing out leaflets or DVDs about Muhammad, we need to understand that this material is highly selective and does not really represent who Muhammad was. Muslim leaders insist that Muhammad is the best example for all humanity for all time, but they are very selective as to what we are allowed to read about him. And this is where Christianity and Islam are very different. As Christians, we tell people everything about Jesus and encourage them to read the earliest accounts of his life. But in Islam, we are only told certain things about Muhammad and we are not encouraged to read the earliest accounts of his life. I now want to move on to Muhammad's time in Medina. When his uncle died, Muhammad lost his protection and moved to the town of Medina. This leaving from Mecca to Medina is called the Hijra and is a major turning point in Muhammad's life. There were already Muslims in Medina, and so when Muhammad went there, he was supported. He became a judge for them and negotiated peace within the town. It was here that he started an army, and this is when the Islamic calendar begins. It does not begin with his birth or when he claimed to be a prophet, but with the beginning of the first Islamic state. He continued to recite the Quran, now with instructions about warfare, legal issues, how to treat people of other religions, and the promise of paradise for those who would join him. With his army, he began raiding and making alliances with different tribes. Narrated Jabir, the Prophet sent us as an army unit of 300 warriors under the command of Abu Ubaidah to ambush a caravan of the Quraysh. The Apostle of Allah sent Khaled ibn al-Walid with 400 Muslims to Bani al-Harith. He ordered him to invite them to Islam three times before fighting. They accepted what he had called them to. Anas bin Malik reported, The Messenger of Allah used to attack the enemy when it was dawn. He would listen for the Adhan, the Islamic call to prayer. So if he heard an Adhan, he stopped. Otherwise, he made an attack. He also sent soldiers to destroy the other religious centers within Arabia. Mecca did not have the only Kaaba or shrine at this time. There were others. And as he was able, Muhammad had them destroyed. Now, we need to be very clear. This was offensive warfare, not defensive, but offensive. It is often claimed that Muhammad only fought in self-defense, but this is not true. Some of his fighting was in self-defense, but much of it was offensive. Muhammad organized many raids, and this was an important time of training for his disciples. In the same way that Jesus prepared his disciples by sending them out to preach, so did Muhammad by sending out his disciples and companions to fight. Some Muslims did not want to fight, but Muhammad made it clear that fighting for him gave you a higher spiritual status before God and in the Islamic community. The Quran says, not equal are those believers who sit at home and receive no hurt and those who strive and fight in the cause of God with their goods and their persons. God has granted a grade higher to those who strive and fight with their goods and persons than those who sit at home. And so we see that Muhammad created a culture of militancy and battle-hardened soldiers. Now, how did people convert to Islam? How did people accept Muhammad as a prophet? There were various ways. For some, it was conviction. They heard what Muhammad said and believed. Others had conviction and accepted Muhammad as a prophet, but also had their own tribal prophet too, whom they continued to follow along with Muhammad. Muhammad was not the only person claiming to be a prophet at this time. There are instances where Muhammad used money 
to help people convert to Islam. The apostle told them to tell Malik that if he came to him as a Muslim, he would return his family and property to him and give him a hundred camels. On hearing this, Malik came out and rode off to join the apostle. He, Muhammad, gave him back his family and property and gave him a hundred camels, and he became an excellent Muslim. The Islamic commentaries on Surah 9 verse 60 give other examples of Muhammad doing this. Other times, people converted from intimidation. We see this with the Khatma tribe. Muhammad had been fighting this tribe, and an old man from this tribe named Abu Afak wrote poems to encourage his men not to give up in their struggle against Muhammad. Muhammad had him assassinated. Then a woman from the tribe, Asma bint Marwan, spoke up to encourage her tribe. Muhammad had her assassinated too. And then we read, The day after bint Marwan was killed, the men of the tribe of Khatma became Muslims because they saw the power of Islam. And so this tribe converted when they saw the power of Islam. What was the power they saw? It was the power to kill those who spoke against it. Also, if you were fighting Muslims, you could surrender and say, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet and you were not allowed to be killed. Therefore, people became Muslim in a whole range of different ways, some from conviction, some for profit, and some from compulsion. Muhammad also had significant dealings with Jewish tribes. They did not accept him as a prophet, and this led to hostilities between them and the Muslims. Of the three Jewish tribes in Medina, the first were exiled with their possessions, the second were exiled without their possessions, and the third had their men executed and women and children enslaved. Then Muhammad fought the Jews to the north in the towns of Kaibar and conquered them. Muhammad himself fought on many occasions, but had four famous battles. The first was the Battle of Badar. This was when a loaded Meccan caravan was returning from Syria and Muhammad wanted to raid it. The Meccans heard about this and sent an army to defend it, but the Muslims defeated them. The second was the Battle of Ahud. This was where the Meccans came seeking revenge for the defeat at Badr. On this occasion, the Muslims lost. The next was the Battle of the Trench. Here, several of the Arabian tribes united in a last effort to stop Muhammad. They came to attack Medina, but the Muslims had dug a trench which stopped their advance. There was a siege, but they were unsuccessful and Muhammad was able to continue to grow in his power. The last battle was the conquest of Mecca. Here Muhammad marched from Medina to Mecca with thousands of soldiers. The Meccans surrendered and converted to Islam. Now, after Muhammad had conquered Mecca, what did he do? He established Mecca as the center of Islamic worship. He went to the central shrine called the Kaaba and prayed and removed all the idols from it except the black stone. He changed very few of the ceremonies that were performed in Mecca, but now they were given Islamic meanings. After his conquest of Mecca, representatives from the other Arabian tribes now came and gave allegiance to Muhammad. Muhammad then started to make plans to conquer outside of Arabia. First, he sent official representatives to the surrounding nations, to the kings of Byzantium and Persia, to the ruler of Egypt, the king of Abyssinia and the Arab rulers. Their message was, one, there is a new prophet, two, offer submission and accept Islam and you will be safe from the Muslim armies. And here we see the great commission of Muhammad. And it is helpful to compare it to that of Jesus. Jesus' great commission was to send out preachers to proclaim repentance and faith and a message of salvation. Muhammad's great commission was to send out armies and the message was of Islamic supremacy. It is he who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may uplift it above every religion. Now, what was Muhammad trying to do? Was it just another kingdom? No, it was the kingdom of Allah, the kingdom of God, the Islamic empire, the theocracy where God ruled through his prophet. 
the new age had come and the struggle or jihad for the Muslims was to bring this Islamic rule to bear upon the world. Now, Muhammad died before he could lead this invasion on the surrounding nations. What do you think happened after he died? Many tribes apostatized from Islam and refused to pay zakat. Many false prophets rose throughout the length and breadth of Arabia and many people offered allegiance to them. The argument that weighed with them was that a living prophet was to be preferred to one who was dead. We see that after Muhammad's death, many Arabian tribes left Islam. Others refused to pay the zakat or Islamic tax and others followed other prophets. It seemed that their conversion to Islam during the time of Muhammad had been very superficial. The new Islamic ruler or caliph was Abu Bakr. He began the war on these apostate tribes and one by one they were forced back into Islam. Having consolidated Islam this way, Abu Bakr now turned his attention to the conquest of the nations that Muhammad had started. The Muslim armies were battle-hearted and conquered an enormous area from India to Spain within 120 years and established the Islamic empire on the world stage. Now, how does the Bible interpret the life of Muhammad and the history of Islam? To answer this, we must know the rest of Islam's history. For within 30 years of Muhammad's death, Muslims were assassinating Muhammad's closest companions as they fought civil wars over who should lead the Islamic empire. Internal warfare has always been part of Islam's history. In fact, reading the history of Islam is almost like reading the history of Israel that we find in the books of Samuel and Kings. In those books, we see that the kingdom of Israel forms and then divides and fights within itself and fails to be God's kingdom on earth. It fails to be the theocracy. The Israelites were meant to be living as God's people under his law, but sin corrupted this and they turned away from God. And this is the message of the prophets, that humans trying to run the theocracy fail and instead bring blasphemy to God's name. This is why the prophets in the Bible promised that God would send his Messiah who would bring his kingdom, that God himself would do what we cannot do. The empire that Muhammad started was doomed from the start because people are sinful and cannot bring God's kingdom. Islam has never worked. It still doesn't work today and it only gives people a false hope. It is only Jesus who is able to bring God's kingdom. Jesus is the one who can deal with the problem of sin. Jesus is the one who can change people's hearts through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Messiah, God's perfect leader. And when he was raised from the dead, he started God's eternal resurrected kingdom. The only theocracy that works is Jesus at the right hand of God. And this is the great message of the gospel, that God has established his kingdom through Jesus and we can be members of it because of what Jesus has done for us. And this is the message of the kingdom that we are to share with our Muslim friends.